there's blasphemy laws in um, one out of every four countries or territories in the world. Uh, there's over a dozen which punishes about punishes blasphemy with the death penalty, and those are all Islamic states. Um, and of course, uh, we know very clearly that this doesn't only affect ex-Muslims and atheists and free thinkers, but also religious, sexual minorities, and also anyone who basically doesn't uh, follow the line. And I think I want to focus, though, on this very important issue which Muslim has raised, which is this roadmap to abolition. How do we go about it? What, what else do we have to do? And of course, a lot of this work is being carried out, but I think one key is, of course, in the legal sphere. And Nick uh, alluded to this in his talk. And I think that is hugely important because, as we know, um, you know, the fight for justice, whether it's for gay rights or um, an end to segregation and Jim Crow laws in the United States or for women's suffrage, uh, we see that very often these are battlefields uh, uh, these, in these battlefields, uh, the fight for change in the law is very key, and that's one important step in abolition. I think it's clear that abolishing laws are not necessarily, um, uh, it's not necessarily the same as actually having an end to discrimination and violence and so on and so forth. We know that very well with the case of George Floyd, one of many uh, black men in America who despite, you know, civil rights movement changes in the law still uh, are like dead men walking and are getting killed left, right and center in the United States. So we know it's not the end all, but it is an important step because it draws a line and says what is acceptable in society and what isn't. And I think we could start in a specific country, I think those with legal expertise, I'm not one of them, would need to look at these countries which punish apostasy or blasphemy with the death penalty and have a, a strategy on which countries to target. There has been news that Sudan has decided to scrap it's both blasphemy and apostasy laws. And I think that is a huge step forward that makes it one less country uh, under Islamic rule that's doing that. I think a, a huge reason behind that is the revolution in Sudan that took place a while back. You know, with women at the forefront, that has had a positive impact on blasphemy and apostasy law issues too. And we have to use that and move forward and try to abolish it elsewhere. The other important issue, of course, is political will. And I think it is difficult to have political will uh, of those in power to end these because there is a, they have an interest in maintaining uh, blasphemy laws, in maintaining apostasy laws. I think uh, it, it helps to maintain their supremacy, it helps to maintain their privilege, and it's a very useful tool, not only for social control, but for political, for economic, for all forms of control of, of the society. And I think Given that you know we are seeing a rise of the religious right uh, across the globe, uh, it, it, it's clear that this interest is not there in many in many uh, situations. And I think the default when we look at apostasy and blasphemy laws is that the society is religious, though that might not necessarily be the case. In the same way that the default is uh, male in in societies where the, and all societies where sexism, for example, is rampant, or uh, the default is white in countries where racism is rampant. So I think given that, plus the fact that there's very little accountability in such situations, so the, the, and the reality is that even good laws, and good laws usually come about not because uh, the ruling elite have decided they want to be nice, uh, but because it has been taken. Uh, in a sense, via vast social and political movements, uh, we, we know very clearly that even good laws without accountability are, are really worthless. And I think uh, George Floyd is another good example. I mean, I think it's, it's important to mention this tragedy because this tragedy affects all of us uh, uh, in, in the fight for social justice uh, and, and the fight against racism, uh, as well as uh, against other unjust laws. If you look at his lynching effectively by a policeman sitting on his neck, this policeman, for example, had many other um, allegations against him of killing, of beating, of torturing, and so on and so forth, and yet not once has he been disciplined. And therefore, uh, there is this belief 
by those who are, uh, uh, you know, representing uh, those in power and the dominant narrative, that they can get away with literally murder. And we see that even in a place like Bangladesh, where there is no blasphemy law, that the Islamists are able with impunity to murder beloved heroes, really, like Abhijit Roy and others, and uh, the so-called secular government even turning a blind eye to this. So I think, you know, accountability is key. And I think families have a huge role to play in this demand for accountability. If you look at the mothers of Argentina, for example, if you look at, uh, you know, Stephen Lawrence's mother, he was a, a young man who was uh, who was killed uh, by racists in, in London. His mother, um, you know, has had a huge role in changing uh, the narrative here and even, uh, you know, uh, challenging institutional racism in the uh, uh, police um, here in Britain. Uh, the role families play is, is key. And unfortunately, we still don't have enough families speaking up uh, because, of course, uh, of the risks involved, but also because they feel uh, ashamed uh, of the reality that their children have been uh, charged with blasphemy apostasy and the need for families to step forward and to demand accountability because accountability is so key in being able to uh, gain justice. One of the other things I think that's very key in uh, this um, fight for getting rid of blasphemy laws is of course public outrage. I think you know this is one of the key areas because as I said before, uh, those in power never give up uh, their their privilege uh, and their supremacy, uh, you know, on a on a golden platter. It's very often taken by force uh, by social and political movements. There's a huge difference between force and violence, which is in, intrinsic in in many of in in all states really, but specifically and more specifically so in Islamic states. And I think. Public outrage really has an important role to play in uh, forcing action, in changing laws, in, in changing culture, and also in uh, making unacceptable, unacceptable what was acceptable possibly weeks or months even before. And I think uh, this sort of public outrage and mobilization is something that we really uh, need to uh, focus on. And I think a lot of our groups are focusing on that. The the effects, for example, of apostasy and blasphemy laws on the lives of people. And I think social media can be a great help to us. It, it has been a great help to the fascists and the racists and the neo-Nazis, Donald Trump, one of them. But I do think that it has also given us those who have no access and those who have no power access in a way that we've never had before. So we have to continue giving visibility to blasphemy and apostasy laws. I think one of the things that George Floyd's case showed us is that no matter how much they lie about, uh, you know, um, resisting arrest and this and that, that the video footage removed their mask and their lies and it helped to bring about that mass. Uh, the mass protests that we're seeing today. So I think, you know, it, it also it humanizes those that have been for so long dehumanized. And I think those who are condemned with blasphemy and apostasy cases are, are, uh, are exactly in the situation, the callousness uh, with which they are, uh, you know, annihilated, eradicated, uh, killed, tortured, as if they are not even human. And I think removing that mask is something that we have a huge responsibility to do. Um, and as, as uh, Ibrahim said completely, is that this is not something that only ex-Muslims or apostates and blasphemers can do in the same way that all the great movements that brought about change, whether it is the civil rights movement in the United States, whether it is the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, whether it is uh, the, the fight for women's suffrage for gay rights, all of these fights included more than those who were fighting for their specific rights. Um, you know, and, and there is, I know, very often we hear this term allies, people who are not part of, who are not black or who are not ex-Muslim, they're allies. I don't like that term because I think as human beings, we are invested and we have to have ownership in struggles against blasphemy and apostasy laws, as well as in uh, struggles against racism. I have a problem with identity politics for one for this very reason as well, because only real victims and not 
just anyone as part of the group. The most authentic part of that group is the only one who is able to speak out about the injustice that's taking place. Uh, and I think, in a sense, this, this is a human uh, issue and one that everyone needs to speak up to, uh, for. And everyone has a responsibility to do it. I think when we se separate identities and uh, isolate and segregate people, uh, then others uh, don't see the need uh, or the impetus and the responsibility and duty to intervene when lives are at stake. I think another issue I'd like to raise, because I've already spoken for 11 minutes, but I want to just get through my key points, is that um, this whole victim-based approach, you know, of course, you know, it's important for victims to speak up, but again, also, I think uh, the very fact that someone's threatened with apostasy and blasphemy, but then goes and, for example, perpetrates racism or bigotry against migrants or Muslims, you know, they have a prerogative to do that, but what helps that larger movement for human rights, for equality, for an end to discrimination is one that goes beyond those divisions and sees our common humanity. And I do believe in that old saying, you know, an injury to one is an injury to all. And I think that has always been the key to successful movements. You can't, for example, liberate women if half the world's population doesn't want to support it. You have to bring in men to support women's liberation. You have to bring in believers to support the rights of apostates and blasphemers. The other um, thing that's very key in bringing about uh, change and an end to blasphemy and apostasy laws is, of course, direct action, protests, being in the public space, you know, and giving visibility, normalizing dissent, I think is hugely important because it also shows that there are so many who do not agree with these laws. And the more of us who come up and speak up, the more of a snowball effect it will have, the more of an impact it will have. I think also this is the, you know, going back fundamentally to this issue being a human rights issue, the right to be free from religion, the right to be critical, uh, of religion and to be able to, like like uh, those who are able to defend their religion, to believe in their religion, there are others who have the right not to do so. And I think this is hugely important. One of, I think, a, not a bulwark to us making this a huge social movement is not just that we don't have enough believers supporting us, uh, but that we have a lot of atheists, a lot of humanists, a lot of secularists who do not support our struggle against blasphemy laws. They might do so in principle, on a um, you know, as a matter of principle, on a on a basically general scale. But they will always come and uh, you know say, "Don't provoke. Uh, you're going too far. Uh, what did you do to get the death threats uh, that you've you've received?" There's a lot of victim blaming going on, and you see that across the board. Uh, in, in, in many other movements where people are fighting for their rights, what did George Floyd do? What, you know, did he resist arrest? As if that is, even if he resisted arrest, which he didn't, even if he uh, used a, um, a fraudulent check, because we're in coronavirus uh, era where people are starving, literally, even so, does that mean that he should be killed? If someone did actually uh, criticize Muhammad, Islam's prophet, if someone did uh, criticize surahs in the Quran, even so, is that something that should be a crime, should it be punishable by death? And we hear often accusations of Islamophobia and others which try to blame those who are uh, trying to speak their minds. And, and the reality is that freedom of expression is not a group right. Because I belong to the ex-Muslim community or the Muslim community doesn't mean I have to speak as the community decides. Freedom of expression, freedom of conscience, they are individual rights. And I, as an individual, will choose how I express myself. You don't like it? Go ahead and express yourself any way you want. But I will express myself in the way that I think is important and is my right to do so. I want to end here with a quote from Martin Luther King, and I think it's important for us to make those links with the civil rights movement in the United States, the Black Lives Movement in the United States, I think that our movements are intrinsically linked. And if uh, one movement moves forward, it is 
a move forward for all of us. I want to end. Sorry, I'm going to turn on the light because I can't see anymore. <laughs> I want to read a, a letter that Martin Luther King wrote, a short excerpt of it, um, when he was in jail in Birmingham in 1965. And I think this is something that will speak to all of those of us who are blasphemers and apostates and who've had quite enough from the moderates who are always telling us how to speak. Uh, Martin Luther King says, first, I must confess that over the last few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride towards freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace which is the absence of tension, a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods or direct action, who paternalistically feels he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season. There is no convenient season. We want an end to blasphemy and apostasy laws. We will fight for it. And we demand that everyone who believes in freedom of conscience and expression to join us in this fight. Don't keep telling us how to speak. Focus your energies on apostasy and blasphemy laws. And remember that this is this goes beyond whether you're from a Muslim background or not. It is about the human right to freedom of conscience and freedom of expression. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maryam. And I love how you connected the struggle of fighting against blasphemy laws with the to today's struggle in America against racism and uh, uh, police brutality, etc. Uh, systematic, you know, systematic uh, racism, uh, um, and and how uh, the the blaming of victims on the way they're uh, protesting. Um, regardless of, of the legitimacy of that criticism is uh, pointing energy in the wrong direction. The, the real struggle is fighting blasphemy laws. The real struggle is that there are thousands of people who have, whose voices are suppressed because of, because of these laws and because of uh, also social pressure. Sometimes we create uh, these laws in our social circles. So not only governments are, should be, should be blamed also, uh, families or social structures that that create uh, these kind of laws, um, and uh, you know we have had a, a campaign recently called uh, shunning is psychological torture, you know, so using shunning as a as a method. The same thing applies here in the United States that we should focus on the on the causes of this uh, embedded rage and 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 anger. Um, and the systematic uh, violations of human rights. Thank you very much, Marian. We'll come back to you for a further dialogue. Okay, we have a question. The theme of making allies to promote long-term goal keeps coming up from the speakers I listen to. What is the hardest part of bridging ideological gaps with groups that could be potential allies? Perhaps, Mariam, you want to tackle this? Uh, yeah, sure. Did you say me? Sorry, my internet is a bit yes. messed up. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I have, actually have a problem with the term ally. Um, I think, I, I don't see why people are allies. Is it because, for example, they're not ex-Muslims, they're allies. I mean, for me, if, it is, uh, if it's a Muslim, an ex-Muslim, a humanist, an atheist, a Christian, whoever, a Jewish, who is blasphemy laws, then they are part of the anti-blasphemy law movement. And I, I, I don't think we should be dividing people into who's the authentic and rightful victim, and only I can speak about it, and everybody else is not an expert or how they stop the blasphemy laws. Uh, you know, they're, they're just allies. Uh, and I think what it does is it divides our movement, and I think we shouldn't be doing that. We, Of course, you know, every movement, whether you look at the anti-apartheid movement, the civil rights movement, there's huge differences of opinion. Just if you take the civil rights movement in the United States between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and so many others in between, where there were differences in strategy and tactics and so on. However, I think when you are creating a mass movement, it is, despite any ideological differences, 
identified by differences in so-called backgrounds and so-called identities that we have combos and I think that you know that's where we need to be um, that's where we can build this movement and that's why we can include believers and non-believers who agree that blasphemies are inhuman they are uh, you know not worthy of citizens of the 21st century and so for me I think um, you know it, it's it's not so much about making allies, it's about creating that movement. And also I think the problem with the term allies, as I mentioned, is that it does then give people the sense that this is not their movement. And we're not gonna win if a lot of people don't think that ending blasphemy laws is their movement in the same way that those who are part of Black Lives Matters have to know that we are also part of that movement. You know what I mean? If, if you're just allies, you kind of, cry a little bit uh, for, for George Floyd and then you feel a little upset and you shout at your TV and then you go about business as usual. And I think, you know, we need to build this movement where we are invested in, in changing this. And I think one of the ways is to say, look, blasphemy or laws doesn't only affect us psycho-atheists that make fun of religion and mock religion and ridicule religion. A lot of, a lot of religious minorities, sexual minorities, women, anyone who doesn't obey the dominant narrative because it is not as much about religion as it is about power and control and in, in maintaining supremacy and privilege and so I think you know it's a challenge to to power and that's why we need all of us because they are very powerful but in numbers and in a mission we are many more if we can break through you know these divisions of identity politics and dividing people into allies and not. Thank you Mariam. Um, we will take final comments before we conclude because we run out of time. Brahim. Yeah I um Thank you, everyone. This is actually really great. Um, I wanted to a couple of things. One is like when we're talking about working with 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 Muslim groups, we've uh, the only group we've worked in with, with Muslimish is progressive Muslim group. We had a conference with them in Boston at uh, MIT last year. It was hosted by uh, Secular Society at MIT, and uh, that ended up, you know, being instead of like talking about the common goals, the common objectives that we can that can, we can achieve together, it ended up being talking about our differences. And I think that was because it, um, the, I think that was one of the biggest challenges is that whenever we work with Muslim groups, they want to assert the fact that they are very Muslim because they are always attacked by the, the, by the religious right, by the real extreme groups that they are atheists. So when they sit next to, you know, us, on a panel, they want to assert the fact that they are very Muslim and everything they believe is in Islam, and, and that's fine. And I think we kind of need that. We are not going to censor ourselves because that's why we, we started our movement in the first place. We just, I think, have to uh, be selective in the topics of discussion. If we can go in with um, definitive... Uh, topics about abolishing blasphemy laws, and this is what we're going to talk about because this is what unite us. I think it will be very effective because there's also the the, the practical side of this. We are dealing. We're gonna if we if we want to achieve this goal, if we want to actually like gonna get these blasphemy laws removed, we're gonna have to deal with governments that have to explain this to um, a religious majority, and they have to have an an excuse. We're gonna have to like have a way out of this. And we can't make it more difficult for them. We want we want to get this done. Uh, so we, we we have to like allow them to have their, their their religious excuse, even though there are other things that are exactly the opposite. If they want to use these couple of verses that you say they're compulsory religion. Great, let them let's use it. I mean, I, I want to as long as we keep the goal. Um, I think that's fine, and we have to. I think that's that's answering the question about what is the hardest thing in in working with so called allies, which I'm not going to use that term. Oh, Go ahead. Can, can, I just, I, can I just say two or three things about this? Um, I mean, one of the things is that I think that, uh, you know, it's not accurate from my perspective to say that there's a religious majority, because I think that 
uh, very often because, you know, uh, there is a dominant uh, Sharia law and a religious right in power that it gives the impression that they are speaking on behalf of a majority. And I'm not sure if that's the case. And I think very often we do see, uh, if you look at revolutions, for example, or uprisings in the Middle East and North Africa, very much so they are not religious uprisings and revolutions. They are very secular. They are very modern. They are very progressive. And I think that, you know, we need to take into account that, that just as Trump doesn't represent all Americans, and, and that religious right in that country. And we're seeing another face of America, though, you know, everyone's always fed Trump and the, the white power type of people, uh, that there, uh, there are many different countries in every society, including those we come from or, you know, uh, that, that are Muslim majority. That's one. The other thing I want to say is, I, you know, I do want to challenge Muslims because I think that, at least from my perspective, every time there has been a reach out to Muslims, it has been from us not from them it has always been from us and we have we are always bending over backwards to include muslims they refuse to come to many of our events uh, at gay pride for example they accuse us of islamophobia whilst we defend both muslim and ex-muslim lgbt they will never defend ex-muslim lgbt so my thing to the muslim moderates is the same thing that martin luther king said to the white moderates which is that you know I am more frustrated with you than I am with the Islamists because I know where I stand with the Islamists. But whether you are constantly making excuses for our expense over our dead bodies. And I think that it's time, and that's what I mean about building a movement, you also have a responsibility in this movement, not just us, you know, because there are also Muslim critics, Muslim reformers who are dying under blasphemy laws because there are Christian and, and other minorities, sexual minorities, women who are dying under these laws. And you have just as much a responsibility as I do. And I will hand, uh, you know, uh, raise my hand in, in, to you and stand with you always. But how many times have you stood with me? Honestly, there's not that many times. There, there are not that many times. And I think, you know, they need to start asking themselves very, very strong questions about why they haven't taken part and where their responsibility lies in these apostasy and blasphemy laws. Their silence is killing us. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure uh, hearing the other speakers. Thank you to the wonderful Muslimish Ibrahim and Wisdom. It's always great to, to be with you guys um, and uh, to be part of your important work. I, I do want to just end by saying, I suppose, um, you know, one of the things that we often face is that, you know, we're told that we're disrespectful or that we're insulting religious sensibilities and, um, you know, um, and uh, that there are some things that are sacred and taboo and that we shouldn't be um, speaking about those issues. But, I mean, I think, you know, what's very clear is that what is sacred to one person is not sacred to, uh, to another. Um, I might be offended by a lot of religious tenets. I, I am offended by a lot of religious tenets. I come from Iran, and when I pass a, a mosque, I do feel physically ill. But that doesn't mean that I have to demand uh, mosques being shut down, of course they shouldn't be shut down. People have a right to their religion. And I would like Muslims to also, you know, uh, look at this from this perspective. You might not like what I say. Uh, you, you don't have to respect what I say. You can argue with me till we go blue in the face. But what I do expect from you is that you respect my right to think as I want and to live as I want in the same way that I respect your right to do that, as long as we're not harming anyone. And I think that is really key. And until believers join us and take responsibility, the silent, the decent majority of Muslims who, like my parents, like many of our families, who would never hurt, 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 harm even a fly, uh, you know, they have a responsibility to speak up in our defense and not just in our defense, in their own defense, because this is about, you know, that fundamental fight. An injury to one is an injury to all. And it, it's a fight for our common humanity. Uh, and, you know, freedom of expression, freedom of conscience, these are cornerstones of rights across the globe. And they have a responsibility to stand with us. This is their fight, too. And I am waiting. I am waiting for them to join us in the way that we deserve and that they should.